I'm going to read three short stories from The Chronicles of Clovis by Saki. Hector Hugh Monroe, who wrote under the pen name Saki, was born 1870, died 1916. The Chronicles of Clovis was first published in 1911. This material is okay to be listened to by children. The Chartres Betterclume Method Lady Carlotta stepped out onto the platform of the small wayside station and took a turn or two up and down its uninteresting length to kill time until the train should be pleased to proceed on its way. The Chartres Metterclume Method Lady Carlotta stepped out onto the platform of the small wayside station and took a turn or two up and down its uninteresting length to kill time till the train should be pleased to proceed on its way. Then, in the roadway beyond, she saw a horse struggling with a more than ample load, and a carter of the sort that seems to bear a sullen hatred against the animal that helps him to earn a living. Lady Carlotta promptly betook her to the roadway, and put rather a different complexion on the struggle. Certain of her acquaintances were wont to give her plentiful admonition as to the undesirability of interfering on behalf of a distressed animal, such interference being none of her business. Only once had she put the doctrine of non-interference into practice, when one of its most eloquent exponents had been besieged for nearly three hours in a small and extremely uncomfortable may-tree by an angry boar-pig, while Lady Carlotta, on the other side of the fence, had proceeded with the watercolor sketch she was engaged on, and refused to interfere between the boar and his prisoner. It is to be feared that she lost the friendship of the ultimately rescued lady. On this occasion she merely lost the train, which gave way to the first sign of impatience it had shown throughout the journey, and steamed off without her. She bore the desertion with philosophical indifference. Her friends and relations were thoroughly well used to the fact of her luggage arriving without her. She wired a vague non-committal message to her destination to say that she was coming on by another train. Before she had time to think what her next move might be, she was confronted by an imposingly attired lady who seemed to be taking a prolonged mental inventory of her clothes and looks. "'You must be Miss Hope, the governess I have come to meet,' said the apparition, in a tone that admitted of very little argument. "'Very well, if I must, I must,' said Lady Carlotta to herself, with dangerous meekness. "'I am Mrs. Quabarl continued the lady, and where, pray, is your luggage? It's gone astray, the alleged governess said, falling in with the excellent rule of life that the absent are always to blame. The luggage had, in point of fact, behaved with perfect correctitude. I've just telegraphed about it, she added, with a nearer approach to the truth. How provoking, said Mrs. Quabarl. These railway companies are so careless. However, my maid can lend you things for the night. And she led the way to her car. During the drive to the Cabarro mansion, Lady Carlotta was impressively introduced to the nature of the charge that had been thrust upon her. She learned that Claude and Wilfred were delicate, sensitive young people, that Irene had the artistic temperament, of a uh, highly developed, and that Viola was something or other else of a mold, equally commonplace among children of that class and type in the twentieth century. I wish them not only to be taught, said Mrs. Quabarro, but interested in what they learn. In their history lessons, for instance, 
you must try to make them feel that they are being introduced to the life stories of men and women who really lived, not merely committing a mass of names and dates to memory. French, of course, I shall expect you to talk at meal time several days in the week. I shall talk French four days of the week, and Russian in the remaining three. Russian, my dear Miss Hope, no one in the house speaks or understands Russian. That will not embarrass me in the least, said Lady Carlotta coldly. Mrs. Quabarro, to use a colloquial expression, was knocked off her perch. She was one of those imperfectly self-assured individuals who are magnificent and autocratic, as long as they are not seriously opposed. The least show of unexpected resistance goes a long way towards rendering them cowed and apologetic. When the new governess failed to express wondering admiration of the large newly purchased and expensive car, and lightly alluded to the superior advantages of one or two makes which had just been put on the market, the discomfiture of her patroness became almost abject. Her feelings were those which might have animated a general of ancient warfaring days on beholding his heaviest battle elephant ignominiously driven off the field by slingers and javelin throwers. At dinner that evening, although reinforced by her husband, who usually duplicated her opinions and lent her moral support generally, Mrs. Quabarro regained none of her lost ground. The governess not only helped herself well and truly to wine, but held forth with considerable show of critical knowledge on various vintage matters, concerning which the Quabarros were in no wise able to pose as authorities. Previous governesses had limited their conversation on the wine topic to a respectful and doubtless sincere expression of a preference for water. When this one went so far as to recommend a wine firm in whose hands you could not go very far wrong, Mrs. Quabarro thought it time to turn the conversation into more usual channels. We got very satisfactory references about you from Canon Teep, she observed. A very estimable man, I should think. Drinks like a fish and beats his wife, otherwise a very lovable character, said the governess imperturbably. My dear Miss Hope, I trust you are exaggerating, exclaimed the Quabarros in union. One must, in justice, admit that there is some provocation, continued the romancer. Mrs. Teep is quite the most irritating bridge player that I have ever sat down with. Her leads and declarations would condone a certain amount of brutality in her partner. But to souse her with the contents of the only soda-water siphon in the house on a Sunday afternoon when one couldn't get another, argues an indifference to the comfort of others which I cannot altogether overlook. You may think me hasty in my judgments, but it was practically on account of the siphon incident that I left. We will talk of this some other time, said Mrs. Cobarl hastily. I shall never allude to it again, said the governess with decision. Mr. Quabarl made a welcome diversion by asking what studies the new instructress proposed to inaugurate on the morrow. History, to begin with, she informed him. Ah, history, he observed sagely. Now in teaching them history, you must take care to interest them in what they learn. You must make them feel that they are being introduced to the life stories of men and women who really lived. I have told her all that, interposed Mrs. Quabarl. I teach history on the Chartres Metterklume method, said the governess loftily. Ah, well, yes, said her listeners, thinking it expedient to assume an acquaintance, at least, with the name. What are you children doing out here? demanded Mrs. Quabarl the next morning, on finding Irene sitting rather glumly at the head of the stairs while her sister was perched in an attitude of depressed discomfort on the window seat behind her, with a wolf-skin rug almost covering her. "'We are learning a history lesson,' came the unexpected reply. "'I am supposed to be Rome, and Viola up there is the she-wolf. 
not a real wolf, but the figure of one that the Romans used to set store by, and I forget why. Claude and Wilfred have gone to fetch the shabby women. The shabby women? Yes, they've got to carry them off. They didn't want to, but Miss Hope got one of her father's five bats and said she'd give them a number nine spanking if they didn't. So they've gone to do it. A loud, angry screaming from the direction of the lawn drew Mrs. Quabarrow thither in hot haste, fearful lest the threatened castigation might even now be in process of infliction. The outcry, however, came principally from the two small daughters of the lodge-keeper, who were being hauled and pushed towards the house by the panting and disheveled Claude and Wilfred, whose task was rendered even more arduous by the incessant, if not very effectual, attacks of the captured maiden's small brother. The governess, Fives Bat in Hand, sat negligently on the stone balustrade, presiding over the scene with the cold impartiality of a goddess of battles. A furious and repeated chorus of, I'll tell mother, rose from the lodge children, but the lodge mother, who was hard of hearing, was for the moment immersed in the preoccupation of her wash tub. After an apprehensive glance in the direction of the lodge, the good woman was gifted with the highly militant temper which is sometimes the privilege of deafness, Mrs. Kobaro flew indignantly to the rescue of the struggling captives. Wilfred, Claude, let those children go at once. Miss Hope, what on earth is the meaning of this scene? Early Roman history, the Sabine women, don't you know? It's the Chartres Metterclume method to make children understand history by acting it themselves fixes it in their memory, you know. Of course, if thanks to your interference your boys go through life thinking the Sabine women ultimately escaped, I really cannot be held responsible. You may be very clever and moderate, Miss Hope, said Mrs. Quabarrow firmly, but I should like you to leave here by the next train. Your luggage will be sent after you as soon as it arrives. I'm not certain exactly where I shall be for the next few days said the dismissed instructress of youth. You might keep my luggage till I wire my address. There are only a couple of trunks, and some golf clubs, and a leopard cub. A leopard cub? gasped Mrs. Quabarro. Even in her departure this extraordinary person seemed destined to leave a trail of embarrassment behind her. Well, it's rather left off being a cub. It's more than half grown, you know. A fowl every day and a rabbit on Sundays is what it usually gets. Raw beef makes it too excitable. Don't trouble about getting the car for me. I'm rather inclined for a walk. And Lady Carlotta strode out of the Corboro horizon. The advent of the genuine Miss Hope, who had made a mistake as to the day on which she was due to arrive, caused a turmoil which that good lady was quite unused to inspiring. Obviously, the Corbaro family had been woefully befooled, but a certain amount of relief came with the knowledge. "'How tiresome for you, dear Carlotta,' said her hostess, when the overdue guest ultimately arrived. "'How very tiresome, losing your train and having to stop overnight in a strange place.' "'Oh, dear, no,' said Car Lady Carlotta. Not at all tiresome for me. Esme All hunting stories are the same, said Clovis, just as all turf stories are the same, and all. My hunting story isn't a bit like any you've ever heard, said the Baroness. It happened quite a while ago when I was about twenty three. I wasn't living apart from my husband then, you see. Neither of us could afford to make the other a separate allowance. In spite of everything that the Proverbs may say, poverty keeps together more homes than it breaks up. But we always hunted with different packs. All this has nothing to do with the story. We haven't arrived at the meet yet. I suppose there was a meet, said Clovis. Of course there was a meet, said the Baroness. 
All the usual crowd were there, especially Constance Brottle. Constance is one of those strapping florid girls that go so well with autumn scenery or Christmas decorations in church. I feel a presentiment that something dreadful is going to happen, she said to me. I am looking, am I looking pale? She was looking about as pale as a beetroot that has suddenly heard bad news. You're looking nicer than usual, I said, but that's so easy for you. Before she had got the right bearings of this remark, we had settled down to business. Hounds had found a fox lying out in some gorse bushes. I knew it, said Clovis. In every fox hunting story that I've ever heard, there's been a fox in some gorse bushes. Constance and I were well mounted, continued the Baroness serenely, and we had no difficulty in keeping ourselves in the first flight though it was a fairly stiff run. Toward the finish, however, we must have held rather too independent a line, for we lost the hounds, and found ourselves plodding aimlessly along miles away from anywhere. It was fairly exasperating, and my temper was beginning to let itself go by inches, when on pushing our way through an accommodating hedge we were gladdened by the sight of hounds in full cry in a hollow just beneath us. "'There they go!' cried Constance, and then added in a gasp, "'In heaven's name, what are they hunting?' "'It was certainly no mortal fox. "'It stood more than twice as high, "'had a short, ugly head, and an enormous thick neck. "'It's a hyena!' I cried. "'It must have escaped from Lord Pabham's park.' "'At that moment the hunted beast turned and faced its pursuers, "'and the hounds,' They were only about six couple of them, stood round in a half-circle and looked foolish. Evidently they had broken away from the rest of the pack, on the trail of this alien scent, and were not quite sure how to treat their quarry now that they had got him. The hyena hailed our approach with unmistakable relief and demonstrations of friendliness. It had probably been accustomed to uniform kindness from humans, while its first experience of a pack of hounds had left a bad impression. The hounds looked more than ever embarrassed as their quarry paraded its sudden intimacy with us, and the faint toot of a horn in the distance was seized on as a welcome signal for unobtrusive departure. Constance and I and the hyena were left alone in the gathering twilight. "'What do we do?' asked Constance. "'What a person you are for questions,' I said. "'Well, we can't stay here all night with a hyena,' she retorted. "'I don't know what your ideas of comfort are,' I said, "'but I shouldn't think of staying here all night, even without a hyena. "'My home may be an unhappy one, "'but at least it has hot and cold water laid on, "'and domestic service, and other conveniences, "'which we shouldn't find here. "'We had better make for that ridge of trees to the right.' I imagine the Cowley Road is just beyond. We trotted off slowly along a faintly marked cart track, with the beast following cheerfully at our heels. What on earth are we to do with the hyena? came the inevitable question. What does one generally do with hyenas? I asked curiously. Well, I've never had anything to do with one before, said Constance. Well, neither have I, even if... We knew if we knew its sex, we might give it a name. Perhaps we might call it Esme. That would do in either case. There was still sufficient daylight for us to distinguish wayside objects, and our listless spirits gave an upward perk as we came upon a small, half-naked gypsy brat picking blackberries from a low-growing bush. The sudden apparition of two horsewomen and a hyena set it off crying, and in any case we should scarcely have gleaned any useful geographical information from that source. But there was a probability that we might strike a gypsy encampment somewhere along our route. We rode on hopefully, but uneventfully, for another mile or so. "'I wonder what that child was doing there,' said Constance, presently. "'Picking blackberries, obviously.' I don't like the way it cried, pursued Constance. Somehow its wail keeps ringing in my ears. 
I did not chide Constance for her morbid fancies. As a matter of fact, the same sensation, of being pursued by a persistent fretful wail, had been forcing itself on my rather overtired nerves. For company's sake, I hallooed to Esme, who had lagged somewhat behind. With a few springy bounds, he drew up level, and then shot past us. The wailing accompaniment was explained. The gypsy child was firmly, and I expect painfully, held in his jaws. A merciful heaven! screamed Constance. What on earth shall we do? What are we to do? I am perfectly certain that at the last judgment Constance will ask more questions than any of the examining seraphs. Can't we do something? she persisted tearfully as Esme cantered easily along in front of our tired horses. Personally, I was doing everything that occurred to me at the moment. I stormed and scolded and coaxed in English and French and gamekeeper language. I made absurd, ineffectual cuts in the air with my thongless hunting crop. I hurled my sandwich case at the brute. In fact, I really don't know what more I could have done. And still we lumbered on through the deepening dusk, with that dark, uncouth shape lumbering ahead of us, and a drone of lugubrious music floating in our ears. Suddenly Esme bounded aside into some thick bushes, where we could not follow. The wail rose to a shriek, and then stopped altogether. This part of the story I always hurry over, because it really is rather horrible. When the beast joined us again, after an absence of a few minutes, there was an air of patient understanding about him, as though he knew that he had done something of which we disapproved, but which he felt to be thoroughly justifiable. "'How on earth can you let that ravening beast trot by your side?' asked Constance. She was looking more than ever like an albino beetroot. "'In the first place I can't help it,' I said, "'and in the second place, whatever else he may be, "'I doubt if he's ravening at the present moment.' Constance shuddered. "'Do you think the poor little thing suffered much?' came another of her futile questions. "'The indications were all that way,' I said. "'On the other hand, of course, it may have been crying from sheer temper. Children sometimes do.' It was nearly pitch dark when we emerged suddenly into the high road. A flash of lights and the whir of a motor went past us at the same moment at uncom uncomfortably close quarters. A thud and a sharp screeching yell followed a second later. The car drew up, and when I had ridden back to the spot, I found a young man bending over a dark, motionless mass lying by the roadside. "'You have killed my Esme!' I exclaimed bitterly. Well, "'I'm so awfully sorry,' said the young man. "'I keep dogs myself, so I know what you must feel about it. "'I'll do anything I can in reparation.' "'Please bury him at once,' I said. "'That much I think I may ask of you.' "'Bring the spade, William,' he called to the chauffeur. Evidently, hasty roadside internments were contingencies that had been provided against. The digging of a sufficiently large grave took some little time. "'I say, what a magnificent fellow,' said the motorist as the corpse was rolled over into the trench. "'I'm afraid he must have been a rather valuable animal.' He took second in the puppy class at Birmingham last year, I said resolutely. Constance snorted loudly. Oh, don't cry, dear, I said brokenly. It was all over in a moment. He couldn't have suffered much. Well, look here, said the young fellow, desperately. You simply must let me do something by way of reparation. I refused sweetly, but as he persisted, I let him have my address. Now, of course, we kept our own counsel as to the earlier episodes of the evening. Lord Pabham never advertised the loss of his hyena, when a strictly fruit-eating animal strayed from his park a year or two previously. He was called upon to give compensation in eleven cases of sheep worrying, and practically to restock his neighbor's poultry yards, and an escaped hyena would have mounted up to something on the scale of a government grant. 
The gypsies were equally unobtrusive over their missing offspring. I don't suppose in large encampments they really know to a child or two how many they've got. The baroness paused reflectively and then continued. There was a sequel to the adventure, though. I got through the post a charming little diamond brooch with the name Esme set in a sprig of rosemary. Incidentally, too, I lost the friendship of Constance Broddle. You see, when I sold the brooch, I quite properly refused to give her any share of the proceeds. I pointed out that the Esme part of the affair was my own invention, and the hyena part of it belonged to Lord Pabham, if it really was his hyena, of which, of course, I've no proof. Tobermory It was a chill, rain-washed afternoon of a late August day, that indefinite season when partridges are still in security or cold storage, and there is nothing to hunt. Unless one is bounded on the north by the Bristol Channel, in which case one may lawfully gallop after fat red stags. Lady Blumley's house party was not bounded on the north by the Bristol Channel. Hence there was a full gathering of her guests round the tea table on this particular afternoon. And in spite of the blankness of the season and the triteness of the occasion, there was no trace in the company of that fatigued restlessness which means a dread of the pianola and a subdued hankering for auction bridge. The undisguised, open-mouthed attention of the entire party was fixed on the homely, negative personality of Mr. Cornelius Appen. Of all her guests, he was the one who had come to Lady Blemley with the vaguest reputation. Someone had said he was clever, and he had got his invitation in the moderate expectation on the part of his hostess that some portion at least of his cleverness would be contributed to the general entertainment. Until tea-time that day she had been unable to discover in what direction, if any, his cleverness lay. He was neither a wit nor a croquet champion, a hypnotic force nor a begetter of amateur theatricals. Neither did his exterior suggest the sort of man in whom women are willing to pardon a generous measure of mental deficiency. He had subsided into Mayor Mr. Appen, and the Cornelius seemed a piece of transparent baptismal bluff. And now he was claiming to have launched on the world a discovery beside which the invention of gunpowder, of the printing press, and of steam locomotion were inconsiderable trifles. Science had made bewildering strides in many directions during recent decades, but this thing seemed to belong to the domain of miracle rather than to scientific achievement. And you really ask us to believe, Sir Wilfrid was saying, that you have discovered a means for instructing animals in the art of human speech, and that dear old Tobermory has proved your first successful pupil? It is a problem at which I have worked for the last seventeen years, said Mr. Appen, but only during the last eight or nine months have I been rewarded with glimmerings of success. Of course I have experimented with thousands of animals, but latterly only with cats, those wonderful creatures which have assimilated themselves so marvelously with our civilization, while retaining all their highly developed feral instincts. Here and there among cats one comes across an outstanding superior intellect, just as one does among the ruck of human beings, and when I made the acquaintance of Tobermory a week ago I saw at once that I was in contact with a beyond cat of extraordinary intelligence. I had gone far along the road to success in recent experiments. With Tobermory, as you call him, I have reached the goal. Mr. Appen concluded his remarkable statement in a voice which he strove to divest of a triumphant inflection. No one said rats, 
though Clovis's lips moved in a monosyllabic contortion which probably invoked those rodents of disbelief. "'And you mean to say,' asked Mrs. Resker, after a slight pause, "'that you have taught Tobermory to say and understand easy sentences of one syllable?' "'My dear Miss Resker,' said the wonder-worker, patiently, one teaches little children and savages and backward adults in that piecemeal fashion. When one has once solved the problem of making a beginning with an animal of highly developed intelligence, one has no need for those halting methods. Tobermory can speak our language with perfect correctness. This time Clovis very distinctly said, Beyond rats. Sir Wilfred was more polite but equally skeptical. "'Hadn't we better have the cat in and judge for ourselves?' suggested Lady Blemley. Sir Wilfred went in search of the animal, and the company settled themselves down to the languid expectation of witnessing some more or less adroit drawing-room ventriloquism. In a minute Sir Wilfred was back in the room, his face white beneath its tan, and his eyes dilated with excitement. "'By God, it's true!' His agitation was unmistakably genuine, and his hearers started forward in a thrill of awakened interest. Collapsing into an armchair, he continued breathlessly, I found him dozing in the smoking room and called out to him to come for his tea. He blinked at me in his usual way, and I said, Come on, Toby, don't keep us waiting. And by gad he drawled out in a most horribly natural voice that he'd come when he dashed well pleased. I nearly jumped out of my skin. Appen had preached to absolutely incredulous hearers. Sir Wilfred's statement carried instant conviction. A babel-like chorus of startled exclamation arose, amid which the scientist sat mutely enjoying the first fruit of his stupendous discovery. In the midst of this clamor, Tobermory entered the room and made his way with velvet tread and studied unconcerned across to the group seated round the tea table. A sudden hush of awkwardness and constraint fell on the company. Somehow there seemed an element of embarrassment in addressing, on equal terms, a domestic cat of acknowledged dental ability. The way you have some milk, Tobermory? asked Lady Blumley in a rather strained voice. I don't mind if I do, was the response, couched in a tone of even indifference. A shiver of suppressed excitement went through the listeners, and Lady Blumley might be excused for pouring out the saucer full of milk rather unsteadily. Oh, I'm afraid I've spelt a good deal of it, she said apologetically. After all, it's not my ex-minister, was Tobermory's rejoinder. Another silence fell on the group, and then Miss Resker, in her best district visitor manner, asked if the human language had been difficult to learn. Tobermory looked squarely at her for a moment, and then fixed his gaze serenely on the middle distance. It was obvious that boring questions lay outside his scheme of life. "'What do you think of human intelligence?' asked Mavis Pellington lamely. Oh, of whose intelligence in particular? asked Tobermory coldly. Oh, well, mine, for instance, said Mavis, with a feeble laugh. You put me in an embarrassing position, said Tobermory, whose tone and attitude certainly did not suggest a shred of embarrassment. When your inclusion in this house-party was suggested, Sir Wilfred protested that you were the most brainless woman of his acquaintance, and that there was a wide distortion, uh, distinction between hospitality and the care of the feeble-minded. Lady Blumley replied that your lack of brain-power was the precise quality which had earned you your invitation, as you were the only person she could think of who might be idiotic enough to buy their old car. You know, the one they call the Envy of Sisyphus, because it goes quite nicely uphill if you push it? Lady Blumley's protestations would have had greater effect if she had not casually suggested to Mavis, only that morning, 
that the car in question would be just the thing for her down in her Devonshire home. Major Barfield plunged in heavily to effect a diversion. How about your carryings on with the tortoise shell puss up at the stables, eh? The moment he had said it, everyone realized the blunder. One does not usually discuss these matters in public, said Tobermory frigidly. From a slight observation of your ways since you've been in this house, I should imagine you'd find it inconvenient if I were to shift the conversation to your own little affairs. The panic which ensued was not confined to the major. Well, would you like to go and see if Cook has got your dinner ready? suggested Lady Blumley hurriedly, affecting to ignore the fact that it wanted at least two hours to Tobermory's dinner time. Thanks, said Tobermory, not quite so soon after my tea. I don't want to die of indigestion. The cats have nine lives, you know said Sir Wilfrid heartily. Possibly, answered Tobermory, but only one liver. Adelaide, said Mrs. Cornett, do you mean to encourage that cat to go out and gossip about us in the servants' hall? The panic indeed had become general. A narrow ornamental balustrade ran in front of most of the bedroom windows at the towers and it was recalled with dismay that this had formed a favorite promenade for Tobermory at all hours, whence he could watch the pigeons, and heaven knows what else besides. If he intended to become reminiscent in his present outspoken strain, the effect would be something more than disconcerting. Mrs. Cornett, who spent much time at her toilet table, and whose complexion was reputed to be of a nomadic, though punctual, disposition, looked as ill at ease as the major. Miss Scrawen, who wrote fiercely sensuous poetry and led a blameless life, merely displayed irritation. If you are methodical and virtuous in private, you don't necessarily want everyone to know it. Bertie Van Tan who was so depraved at seventeen that he had long ago given up trying to be any worse, turned a dull shade of gardenia white, but he did not commit the error of dashing out of the room like Odo Finsbury, a young gentleman who was understood to be reading for the church, and who was possibly disturbed at the thought of scandals he might hear concerning other people. Clovis had the presence of mind to maintain a composed exterior, Privately he was calculating how long it would take to procure a box of fancy mice through the agency of the exchange and mart as a species of hush money. Even in a delicate situation like the present, Agnes Resker could not endure to remain too long in the background. Why did I ever come down here? she demanded dramatically. Tobermory immediately accepted the opening. Judging by what you said to Mrs. Cornett on the croquet lawn yesterday, you were out for food. You described the Blumleys as the dullest people to stay with that you knew, but said they were clever enough to employ a first-rate cook, otherwise they'd find it difficult to get anyone to come down a second time. Well, there's not a word of truth in it. I appeal to Mrs. Cornett, explained the discomfited Agnes. Mrs. Cornett repeated your remark afterwards to Bertie Van Tan, continued Topermory, and said, That woman is a regular hunger marcher. She'd go anywhere for four square meals a day. And Bertie Van Tan said, At this point the chronicle mercifully ceased. Topermory had caught a glimpse of the big yellow Tom from the rectory working his way through the shrubbery towards the stable wing. In a flash he had vanished through the open French window. With the disappearance of his too brilliant pupil, Cornelius Appen found himself beset by a hurricane of bitter upbraiding, anxious inquiry, and frightened entreaty. The responsibility for the situation lay with him, and he must prevent matters from becoming worse. Could Tobermory impart his dangerous gift to other cats was the first question he had to answer. It was possible, he replied, that he might have initiated his 
intimate friend the stable puss into his new accomplishment, but it was unlikely that his teaching could have taken a wider range as yet. Then, said Mrs. Cornett, Tobermory may be a valuable cat and a great pet, but I'm sure you'll agree, Adelaide, that both he and the stable cat must be done away with without delay. You don't suppose I've enjoyed the last quarter of an hour, do you? said Lady Blumley bitterly. My husband and I are very fond of Tobermory. At least we were before this horrible accomplishment was infused into him, but now, of course, the only thing to do is to have him destroyed as soon as possible. We can put some strychnine in the scraps he always gets at dinner time, said Sir Wilfrid, and I will go down and drown the stable cat as myself. The coachman will be very sore at losing his pet, but I'll see a very catching form of mange has broken out in both cats, and we're afraid it, of it spreading to the kennels. But my great discovery, expostulated Mr. Appen, after all my years of research and experiment. You can go and experiment on the shorthorns at the farm who are under proper control, said Mrs. Cornett, or the elephants at the zoological gardens. They are said to be highly intelligent, and they have this recommendation that they don't come creeping about our bedrooms and under chairs and so forth. An archangel ecstatically proclaiming the millennium, and then finding that it clashed unpardonably with Henley, and would have to be indefinitely postponed, could hardly have felt more crestfallen than Cornelius Appen at the reception of his wonderful achievement. Public opinion, however, was against him. In fact, had the general voice been consulted on the subject, it is probable that a strong minority vote would have been in favor of including him in the strychnine diet. Defective train arrangements and a nervous desire to see matters brought to a finish prevented an immediate dispersal of the party. But dinner that evening was not a social success. Sir Wilfred had had rather a trying time with the stable cat, and subsequently with the coachman. Agnes Resker ostentatiously limited her repast to a morsel of dry toast, which she bit as though it were a personal enemy, while Mavis Pellington maintained a vindictive silence throughout the meal. Lady Blumley kept up a flow of what she hoped was conversation, but her attention was fixed on the doorway. A plateful of carefully dosed fish scraps was in readiness on the sideboard, but sweets and savory and dessert went their way, and no Tobermory appeared, either in the dining room or kitchen. The sepulchral dinner was cheerful compared with the subsequent vigil in the smoking room. Eating and drinking had at least supplied a distraction and cloak to the, the prevailing embarrassment. Bridge was out of the question, in the general tension of nerves and tempers, and after Odo Finsbury had given a lugubrious rendering of Melisande in the Wood to a frigid audience, music was tacitly avoided. At eleven the servants went to bed, announcing that the small window in the pantry had been left open as usual for Torbumori's private use. The guests read steadily through the current batch of magazines and fell back gradually on the bad Minton library and bound volumes of punch. Lady Blumley made periodic visits to the pantry, returning each time with an expression of listless depression, which forestalled questioning. At two o'clock, Clovis broke the dominating silence. He won't turn up tonight. He's probably in the local newspaper office at the present moment, dictating the first installment of his memoirs. Lady What's-Her-Name's book won't be in it. It will be the event of the day. Having made this contribution to the general cheerfulness, Clovis went to bed. At long intervals, the various members of the house party followed his example. The servants, taking round the early tea, made a uniform announcement in reply to a uniform question. Tobermory had not returned. Breakfast was, if anything, a more unpleasant function than dinner had been, 
but before its conclusion the situation was relieved. Tobermory's corpse was brought in from the shrubbery, where a gardener had just discovered it. From the bites on his throat and the yellow fur which coated his claws, it was evident that he had fallen in unequal combat with the big Tom from the rectory. By midday most of the guests had quitted the towers, and after lunch Lady Blumley had sufficiently recovered her spirits to write an extremely nasty letter to the rectory about the loss of her valuable pet. Tobermory had been Appin's one successful pupil, and he was destined to have no successor. A few weeks later an elephant in the Dresden Zoological Garden, which had shown no previous signs of irritability, broke loose and killed an Englishman who had apparently been teasing it. The victim's name was variously reported in the papers as Oppen and Eppelin, but his front name was faithfully rendered Cornelius. If he was trying German irregular verbs on the poor beast, said Clovis, he deserved all he got, 